Thanks. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to welcome you all today and to be part of this annual spring gathering of the Gupta Value Scholars. Um, and really delighted to welcome from Northern Virginia Community College, Michigan State University, and our own Rackham Graduate School here at the University of Michigan. Thanks all for, for joining us. You know, before we begin our discussion, I just thought I would like to acknowledge just the difficult circumstances that we've been experiencing over the course of the last year, now a little bit more than a year, including the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on multiple communities. You know, we continue to navigate this challenge while at the same time holding hope that vaccination and other measures are gonna progressively bring this pandemic under control. You know, similarly, we grieve the loss of life in the last month in Boulder, Colorado, and in Atlanta, Georgia, in which eight people, six of whom were of Asian descent and seven of whom were women were killed. The attacks in Atlanta in particular have been experienced as xenophobic and misogynistic. They follow a year in which our country has faced a reckoning about racial injustice as a consequence of the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other black Americans. I have admired the way in which students here at Michigan and elsewhere have responded to the challenges of the last year and their commitment to directly address issues of systemic inequality in its many forms. And to that end, I think it's always important and especially in extraordinary times like these, consider those values that we hold essential. The Gupta Value Scholars through their research, their study, their actions seek to pursue values of personal integrity, respect for human dignity and excellence. I'm so excited to hear from each of our distinguished panelists today, their thoughts on the role of these personal values in contributing to the integrity of our nation. Thank you as well, Margaret and Shashi, for your vision, for your generous support of the Gupta Values uh, Scholars Program, and for your leadership in creating this wonderful opportunity for engagement through today's event. I'm gonna turn it over now to my colleague, Doug Estry from MSU. Doug is the Emeritus Associate Provost for Undergraduate Education and Dean of Undergraduate Studies at Michigan State University. And he'll be introducing our panelists and the format for our discussion. Thanks very much and welcome again. Thanks, Mike. I want to first thank uh, Shashi and Margaret for their continued support of the Gupta Value Scholarship Program. And I also want to thank Dean Solomon and Chris Berry for hosting our virtual annual spring gathering. Uh, as most of you know, normally we would be meeting in Washington DC with Shashi and Margaret to engage in various activities and conversations that highlight the three core values of these scholarships, uh, the ones that Dean Solomon mentioned, excellence, integrity, and human dignity. And hopefully, as I said earlier, we will be back to resume this important part of the scholarship during the coming academic year. This year, we are very fortunate to have three distinguished panelists who have generously agreed to have a conversation with us focusing on the topic of personal and national integrity in a time of crisis. In order to maximize the time that the GVS students have to ask questions, I will briefly introduce our panelists and apologize to them ahead as these short introductions will in no way do justice to their extensive and distinguished career. First, uh, the Honorable Jerry Conley, Congressman Conley is serving his seventh term in the U.S. House of Representatives from Virginia's 11th district, which includes Fairfax and Prince William counties. Congressman Conley is a senior member of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform and serves as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Government Operations. In this position, he is responsible for a broad range of issues from federal workforce and federal agency oversight to federal procurement, information policy, and the United States Postal Service. Congressman Conley also serves on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and is a leading voice on foreign assistance reform, war powers, embassy security, and democracy promotion abroad. During his term in the House, he has had a significant impact on legislation, not only for his district, but for the nation. Some of our GVS have had the pleasure of meeting with Representative Conley uh, during past visits to Washington. And I, for one, have been very impressed with his thoughtful, evidence-based approach to issues, his deep knowledge of history, 
and his grasp of our Constitution and the intent of our founding fathers. Ms. Sarah Longwell is the president and CEO of Longwell Partners, a full service communication firm in Washington, DC. She is co-founder of the organization Defending Democracy Together and its projects, Republicans for the Rule of Law and Republican Voters Against Trump. She is also the publisher of The Bulwark. If you haven't read some of the articles published in The Bulwark, I would highly recommend them. They deal with timely issues in a very balanced and informative way. The articles reflect the kind of dialogue that grows from differences in opinions, perspectives, and ideologies, and demonstrates how differences and their ability to debate these differences can lead us in the direction of beginning to find solutions to our country's and the world's wicked problems. Finally, the Honorable Norman Eisen. Ambassador Eisen is a senior fellow in the governance studies at Brookings and a globally recognized authority on law, ethics, and anti-corruption. From 2009 to 2011, he served as special counsel and special assistant to President Obama for ethics and government reform. From 2011 to 2014, he was ambassador to the Czech Republic. And from 2019 to 2020, he served as special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee for the first impeachment of former President Trump. If you're looking for an interesting read, I would highly recommend his book, A Case for the American People, The United States versus Donald J. Trump. Moving to our format. Each panelist, beginning with Representative Conley, followed by Ms. Longwell, and finally, Ambassador Eisen, will be given 10 minutes, five minutes for opening remarks, and five minutes for questions from a Gupta scholar. For questions in this section, I will call on a specific caller from one of the GVS institutions to ask a pre-prepared question. Following the opening remarks, I will open the conversation for questions from any of the group of scholars. And you may ask questions in two ways. Raise a virtual hand, and when called on, state your name, affiliation, and who the question is for. Or if you prefer that your questions be read by us, send a chat and state your university affiliation who you would like the question directed to, and your question. Please note you may submit questions through the chat function at any time during this meeting. We ask, however, that you not use the chat function for other reasons as it clogs things up pretty quickly. We will do our best, Chris and I, to rotate the questions among the three GVS institutions. So with that, I will turn it over to Representative Conley for his, and I apologize, Jerry, because you have so many other, so much to add, offer us, five minutes of opening remarks. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you, Margaret and Shashi, for your friendship and your leadership in wanting to, um, you know, uh, stimulate this kind of interest and this kind of dialogue, uh, especially among young people. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful investment for our future. And uh, thank you, Mike and Doug and Chris for um, helping to keep us in order today. Uh, the panel's title is Ethics, Personal and National Integrity in a Time of Crisis. From my own personal perspective, having just witnessed a uniquely corrupt and unethical era of American presidential politics, and having done so from the vantage point of a co-equal branch of government, that was repeatedly unable to enforce accountability for brazen ethical lapses and abuses, I'd have to say the word crisis is appropriate. Since this discussion is both about the ethical responsibilities of citizens and people we elect to represent the public interest, I happen to be a federal elected representative. I thought I'd first provide an overview of how Congress approaches ethics and would like to strengthen ethics regimes in the federal government amidst what many view as a crisis indeed of ethics and integrity in government. 
the federal government, there are primarily two approaches to reinforcing ethics and ethical behavior. First is a code of conduct that usually has two components, a positive set of principles. For example, the Congressional Code of Conduct says, a member, delegate, resident commissioner, officer, or employee of the House shall behave at all times in a manner that shall reflect credibly on the House. Take note, Matt, Gray, Matt uh, Gates. Or in the statutory standards for ethical conduct for employees of the executive branch, it says, each employee has a responsibility to the United States government and its citizens to place loyalty to the constitution, laws, and ethical principles above private gain. To ensure that every citizen can have complete confidence in the integrity of the federal government, each employee shall respect and adhere to the principle of ethical conduct set forth in this section, as well as implementing standards <clears throat> contained in this part and supplemental agency regulations. And the other component is a list of prohibited behavioral be uh, actions. You may not accept gifts. You may not receive compensation for official actions. You may not have a financial conflict of interest, et cetera. The second and complementary approach is the enforcement by which individuals who have acted unethically can be held accountable for their actions. For federal employees, they can be tried for criminal wrongdoing or administratively disciplined according to the preference of the head of their respective agency. The problem we saw repeatedly in the Trump administration is that the White House employees who violated and even mocked ethics rules like the Hatch Act were allowed with impunity to do so by the head of their respective agency, <clears throat> namely the President of the United States. For members of Congress, the Office of Congressional Ethics and House and Senate Committees on Ethics can conduct and do investigations and the House and Senate can take adjudicative action, uh, which includes things like reprimand, censure, and even expulsion. One member of the executive branch, however, who lies beyond the reach of traditional approaches to enforcing ethical conduct is the president of the United States himself. There is no presidential code of conduct beyond the few restrictions included in the constitution and enforcement options are limited severely in our constitutional system. That doesn't mean there's no one to oversee presidential behavior. There is of course the Office of Government Ethics, the FBI, Federal Inspectors General, the Government Accountability Office, and Congress itself. And while the Department of Justice does have disciplinary powers, we all are now familiar with the infamous Office of Legal Counsel opinion in the Department of Justice that says, sitting president's amenability to indictment and criminal prosecution, that such action is impermissible. That is to say, you cannot cite indict a sitting president as it would interfere with the executive branch's ability to perform its constitutionally assigned functions. This is an opinion going back to the Nixon administration when Nixon was embroiled in Watergate. It was a very self-serving opinion issued by his Department of Justice, but it was an opinion relied on by Robert Mueller to avoid direct culpability being assigned to the President of the United States for, I would consider on its face, illegal behavior, which ultimately led, of course, to impeachment. So what are the enforcement mechanisms against presidential unethical behavior? Impeachment is if the behavior rises to a level prescribed by the constitution is determined by a majority of the members of the house and two thirds majority for conviction in the Senate. A very high bar, no president's ever been convicted. And of course, elections, when the people decide. There is one part of our federal system that does not have a code of conduct, is not subject to accountability of elections, and they serve lifetime tenures, namely the Supreme Court of the United States. For some reason, the Supreme Court has carved out for itself the status of a mystical druidic priesthood. And I believe this contributes to the crisis of confidence in government and the authority of our constitutional system. Proposed legislative remedy to many of the shortcomings enumerated here is H.R. 1, the For the People Act, a transformative democratic reform package which would expand conflict of interest laws and divestment requirements for members of Congress, gives the Office of Government Ethics teeth to enforce ethics in the executive branch, 
and creates a code of ethics for the Supreme Court, finally. But beyond the strictures of statutory ethics requirements, codes of conduct and ethics enforcement regimes lies a more esoteric concept of ethics that resides more in the individual, that of a personal code of conduct, informed by experience, faith, fear, and really anything else that helps somebody determine right from wrong. And that's where I fear we face our most serious national ethical crisis post-Trump. As I laid out, accountability for unethical behavior is really immediate if applied at all. And we actually rely on norms and common understandings of ethics much more than investigations or laws. That the president of the United States was able to act consistently unethically with regards to his own personal finances, conflicts of interest, bilateral relations with foreign countries for his own political or electoral gain, pressuring election officials to overturn a free, validated, audited, judicially reviewed election, represented an immense challenge to our national integrity. The fact that the president attempted to inoculate himself from accountability by acting in the open and doubling down speaks to a normalization of this kind of unethical behavior that will continue to infect our politics in government unless we seek remedy. And that's why the engagement on these issues of ethics and integrity we're discussing today is so vitally important for the future of constitutional democracy. Thanks for having me here today. I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Representative Connolly. Uh, the first question is from uh, MSU senior Jasmine Jordan. Jasmine is majoring in political science and I'm very proud to say was recently selected as a Gates Cambridge scholar. So Jasmine, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask the first question. Oh, hello, thank you, Doug. Um, so me and a few other students put this together. Um, we were real, I really appreciated what you had to say about ethics and I 100% agreed that the, pres the former president displayed extremely unethical behavior over the past um, five years or so. But how do you, but like he's gone now and now you have to work with people, um, especially politicians that at least based on their rhetoric don't seem to want certain populations to exist at all. Um, and not only for me as a member of multiple marginalized groups, um, respecting other people's opinions can mean working with someone that does not want certain people to have civil rights, um, dislikes marginalized groups, um, and even like spreads the same lie that the former president did that could have led to the extreme harm of you and other colleagues um, or your deaths as we saw on January 6th. So um, how can you reconcile that now um, as you're trying to bring ethics back into government? Yeah, what a great question. Um, and I, I'll be honest with you, uh, Jasmine, I wrestle with that every day. Yeah, I see my, those colleagues very differently post January 6th than I did before January 6th. Uh, this isn't just politics, this is personal. Because you voted with the mob that violently sought to overthrow the election results in the United States presidential election. And in doing that, five people were dead, two more committed suicide, and you sided with that. That means, you know, you put me at risk, you put my staff at risk, you put my family at risk, it's personal. Um, and so trying to build bridges and say, well, yes, but certainly we can cooperate, can't we? is a much more difficult task. Um, and it's a very, it's a much more fragile moment, if not dangerous in American polity. And we have to recognize that we can't gloss over it. Um, it's also a moment as I think you suggest of racial reckoning in America. Are we going to have an honest self-reflective discussion about structural racism in America and uh, and, and let's start with law enforcement since that has cost lives. And so the trial that's going on as we speak um, on Derek Chauvin, the former police officer who killed uh, George Floyd is gonna be a moment of truth and self-reflection. And we'll see how that goes. Um, you know, as well as I do, how often we've been disappointed 
in trial results, in trying to hold, again, the key word here in everything we're talking about, ethically, behaviorally, is accountability. What's the mechanism for accountability? You said something that has power. How are we going to hold you accountable? You said something that incited violence. How are we going to hold you accountable? You did something that crossed a line. How are we going to hold you accountable? And accountability is your protection and my protection. And we've got to do a much better job than simply counting on people to do the right thing or establishing norms, but they're not codified. I wish we didn't have to codify behavior, but Trump proves we do. And so I think we're gonna to have to really go into the crevices of our constitutional system. And for that matter, our society and uh, you know, really ferret out uh, the cancers and address them uh, either legislatively or in other ways uh, to, <coughs> to uh, revive accountability. And one I made reference to is that opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel going back to Richard Nixon. That, that needs to be renounced. That needs to be revoked. Um, a president, no one is above the law, we say. Well, you know, I don't want frivolous uh, uh, indictments of presidents, but on the other hand, when there's criminal behavior, he should not be, she should not be uh, insulated from the law unlike any other American. Thank you. The second question comes from Angie Perone. Angie is a, a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan in social work and sociology. So Angie. Hello, thank you so much. Um, here's my question. The COVID-19 pandemic underscored a growing resistance to science, evidence, and data. The integrity of well-respected scholars and thinking Fauci has been questioned in ways that would be unthinkable just a few years ago. How can we address questions of integrity that stem from a general disbelief of research and science in policy? Yeah, what a great question, Angie. And you know, I live with this all the time and I'll give you a different example, the environment. Um, when the Republicans were in the majority in Congress, they actually purged empirical evidence. They purged scientific studies. They purged scientists they actually banned the use of certain phrases like greenhouse gases, climate change. <laughs> uh, and of course, why did they do that? that? That's censorship, right? They did it because to embrace the science behind the pandemic or behind the environment is to take responsibility. If I acknowledge that global, global climate change is real, then I have bought into a set of responsibilities I have as an elected official to do something about it, to respond to it. And they don't wanna do that. And so it gets them off the hook. And uh, uh, so trying to have an empirical based, uh, a, you know, a scientific based set of public policies um, is something we have to push for. Um, now, the good news is we have a president and uh, you know, in Joe Biden who absolutely is committed to that. And, and we're already able to point to the benefits of that, right? So we've gone from, you know, six, 700,000 vaccinations a day when he was sworn in to three to 4 million a day. Uh, we're seeing us, you know, start to get ahead. A third of Americans are not vaccinated, at least one jab. Uh, the economy looks pretty strong, ready to come back. Uh, so science-based policy making is very important, but you know, we've always had Luddites um, and we've always had know-nothings. Um, I'm using those terms, you know, from a historical point of view, but not using them as epithets. And, uh, you know, uh, we just have to soldier on, but we, we can't assume that, that science is self-evident. There are still flat earthers among us. Um, and so we, we, we just have to be stubborn in pursuing it and insisting on it. And I think we also have to do a better job working through the media. The media is, uh, you know, is really uh, has a responsibility here as well. Um, you know, when, when the media get, engages, for example, in faux equivalents, well, I mean, you know, some people say that evolution is, is correct, but it is a theory. And creationism is also a theory, so they're kind of like the same. 
Well, you know, they're not. And when someone does that in any of these realms on the media, they do a profound disservice and they really mislead the public. So we have a lot of work to do. Academia has a, a lot of work to do uh, in, in pushing beyond academia in, in, in helping to propound science. Um, you know, and I, I'll give you one example of somebody who's done that. You know, the, you know, the science guy, what's his name? Bill Nye. Bill Nye. He's unbelievable. He's gone right at the anti-empiricism. He's gone, he's gone to debate them. He's, he's, he's gotten tough and, you know, well, we need more of that coming out of academia. Uh, so that people hear facts and uh, facts are very stubborn things when repeated. Thank you, Representative Connolly. I'd like to turn now to uh, five minutes of remarks from uh, Ms. Longwell. Hi there, thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks to Shashi and Margaret, it's great to see you both. Um, so I'm gonna pick up, I think where the Congressman left off, you know, this idea of accountability and um, look, I'm gonna admit up front, I'm a Republican, I've been a Republican all my life and um, spent a lot of time working for the private sector, pro-business policies. And when 2016 happened, um, you know, I fought Trump on behalf of, I, I, had, I had many other Republicans that I thought were better suited um, in, in that 16 person uh, Republican primary. Uh, when Trump, I fought Trump in the primaries, when he emerged as the, the winner, I fought him, uh, I was, I was couldn't believe it, but I was out there trying to figure out how to get Hillary Clinton elected. Um, but of course, he he won the election. And when one of the things that led to the crisis of the four years of his presidency, right, when he got elected, I said to all my friends, most of whom are Democrats, I said, you know what, guys, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay because the Republicans are responsible people and they will put guardrails on him. He can't, a president can't just do whatever he wants. He's gonna need Congress. Um, there's gonna be all kinds of responsible people around him that will you know, keep him in line. And it is the thing that I think I've been the most wrong about in my life, uh, which was that Republicans would, would stand up and, and, uh, and it's funny because I, because I was, there was a name for us at the time, I guess it still is, you're called Never Trumpers. Um, and we were, we were Republicans who would never support Donald Trump. He thought, cause we thought he was unethical. He was unfit to be the president. Um, and before he was elected, there were a lot of never Trumpers, just about every mainstream conservative news outlet, national review, everybody, you know, national review sort of famously published, uh, an issue called against, um, against Trump, uh, before, before he was elected and, one by one after Trump became the president, I watched people I'd known my entire career, my entire life. It was like their bodies were snatched. They went from being never Trump to saying, uh, well, maybe it's okay. Maybe this will be fine. Um, starting to make accommodations, starting to even change their political philosophy to say, uh, well, maybe nationalism is sort of a good idea. Um, you know, to sort of abandon everything they'd ever stood for as conservatives. And there was this group of people, I started going to meetings, I started looking for other conservatives who were as concerned as I was about what was going on. And, and because the theme of this talk was about sort of personal and, and, and national integrity, I wanna tell you that I found this room of what I would say at the time were kind of sad Republicans, uh, but it was a bunch of people, many of whom were famous, people that I had grown up reading, Bill Kristol, Linda Chavez, Mona Sharon, they were on, had been on TV all the time in the, the 90s and early 2000s when I was sort of becoming politically aware. And they were all sitting there trying to figure out how is Republicans to oppose Donald Trump? And they did so at great personal cost to themselves. Um, you know, Bill Kristol ran a, a, a venerable conservative publication called The Weekly Standard, and it just got shut down. Like it was not being sufficiently pro-Trump. So the funder pulled their money and, uh, and shut the magazine down. Uh, people lost their jobs. They lost their affiliations. But these were all people who were willing to speak out. And as a group, we sort of came together and we built a bunch of new institutions. The organization, I, I quit my job. Uh, I had spent 15 years. I was a partner at a, a sort of 
a Republican communications firm. I, I quit that firm and started my own firm um, and built a bunch of new organizations that were all meant to challenge Donald Trump from the right. That as Republicans, we were going to stand up to him. We launched a group called Republicans for the Rule of Law um, to, to defend the Mueller investigation from political interference. Um, we launched a magazine after, out of the ashes of the Weekly Standard called The Bulwark, uh, which was a bunch of conservatives talking about why what Trump was doing was a violation of the rule of law. And, and the main thing that, that all of it taught me is that going through life, you are like, people talk about when you're in high school, right? People tell you about peer pressure. Peer pressure is a thing that exists uh, sort of throughout your life. And as politics has become more tribal, there's a constant sense of, I need to go along with my tribe. I need to, you know, everybody who's kind of on my team wearing my jersey, they're doing this. So I need to do this too. Um, but one of the most, so that's my time, I time myself. Um, one of the most important things though, to have a healthy politics is that people within your in-group, within your tribe, that they, they exert accountability there right? Republicans should have been the ones saying to Donald Trump, like, they should have voted for that first impeachment. They should have been the ones that were answering to a higher um, affiliation than the Republican Party. Being an American is more important than being a part of the Republican Party. The, the, the values of being an American, whether it's rule of law, uh, whether it's our commitment to liberal democracy and everybody participating in voting, those are things that transcend political party. And so um, I think the, the, what I want the crux of my remarks to be is that all through your life, um, there's going to be, you're going to, it's easy to bounce along and just go along with your side, but you always want to maintain a North Star of what sort of higher principles are and make sure that that is, that is the key to, to what you're orienting yourself by. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Sarah. The first question for uh, Sarah comes from a Nova sophomore, Helen Agbaparan Wu. And Helen is majoring in early childhood development. And Helen, I am sure I massacred your last name, but welcome. We'll turn it over to you for your question. Thank you. I know I have a lot. last name <laughs> yes thank you for having me and thank you everybody um question is for you miss longwell thank you for all you've been doing i know uh things has been last early this year was like mm, the climax of everything but thank god this is kind of returning. So my question goes to you. How can people uh, act in an ethical manner in politics, especially when pressure is on to really win no matter what happens? So how can people be able to act ethically? Sarah, did you get most of that? I had a little trouble. It was breaking up. I'll tell you what, Helen had some problems, and I have her question in front of me. I'll ask it so, so you can hear it. Ms. That'd be great. Will, Thank you, Bob. We'll act in an ethical manner in politics when the pressure is to achieve a short-term win no matter what. Boy, you just didn't hold back with a really hard question there, right? Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, that's, that is... Um, Look, I, I think uh, this is this is sort of the the basis of, of what I'm talking about, right? There's there are um, take for example the the voting right now the 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 argument over voting rights. Um, I was listening to the the young lady's question before where she was talking about how um, you know there's there's Republicans who don't even believe people should be allowed to like exist or um, and and I think that. You know, I, I, I understand how the rhetoric feels that way, but to me, when I think about what Republicans are doing right now around voting rights, which is about trying to keep certain people from voting, it is like, it is a, just a, a calculated um, play for power, right? This is, this is about how 
they are they are subverting their values in a short term quest for power because they no longer appeal to a broad enough segment of the population uh, that they can win without feeling like they have to suppress certain people's votes. Um, and I think that's wrong. And I think that there's a and I think that you know the way to engage in politics is to ha to to ensure that your your highest values um, don't become sort of subjugated to your quest for raw political power, which means that, and I think that there's lots of Republicans, like I think that Mitt Romney wants people to be able to vote. I don't think he wants to suppress people's votes. Um, I think the same way about Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins. I also think they're under tremendous pressure from the people in their political parties to say, like who are part of their tribe, um, to not, you know, to participate in some of this. And I think that my, everything that I have been doing has been trying to sort of elevate um, the almost the the pressure to provide cover or to constantly remind these politicians of those higher values. Everything that we do is about reminding Republicans that Republicans, you know, that 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 this is like they got into politics because they they loved America and part of being you know part of American values is is that we have a representative democracy where people vote. Um, and so, look, you asked a really hard question that I'm trying to answer uh, because it's it's actually the question you asked is like, how do you make people be better than they are? And like, that's that's hard. That's about, that sort of comes down to like getting better people to run for office <laughs> who are committed to those higher values, and then as voters trying to make sure that you elect people who are committed to those higher values. So it's like a very very big big question and problem. Thank you. The second question um, for Ms. Longwell comes from MSU freshman Morgan Atkins. Uh, Morgan is majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology. Morgan, turn it over to you. Hi, Ms. Longwell. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my question for you is how will people of different parties who have different views, or even like you said, how having different views within your own party on our country's problems be able to overcome their beliefs and look at them in a new perspective? Will their integrity and their human dignity be tested at all? Uh, they're definitely their dignity is being tested. I don't know if you've looked at Congress lately, but it's not as dignified as it as it once was. Um, you know, the way I mean, the way for like when I when I used to think about politics, and I, I hate to say something like when I was your age, but that is how I feel right now. When I was your age, and I was just getting into politics. I thought that politics was about, I hoped that it was about uh, all a whole bunch of people who really wanted the best for America, but who had different ideas about how to get there, uh, sort of existing in this political body and arguing about those ideas and coming to some kind of a compromise that ultimately pushed the country forward. Um, and, and that was a really, I thought that was like a really inspirational thing. Like I love the idea of, of a legislative body having to argue it out and compromise and everybody being a little unhappy and everybody getting a little bit of what they want. Um, I just, you know, and, and I think we need to get back to that, but that is, that is right now one of the, the, the worst things about what's happening is it's almost like a story as old as time, but it's like the, the Hatfields and the McCoys, the Montagues and the Capulets, there's this vortex of backlashes where trust has been broken. Everybody kind of sits around being like, you started it. No, you started it. Um, and, and trust um, and, and the willingness to work together is at an all, is it a low for my lifetime? Maybe it's been like this at other times. I'm sure there's been problems like this before, but right now it is, um, it is an extremely fraught environment to get these two political parties to do anything uh, to work together. And you would think you would think that something like the Capitol insurrection would be like the fever breaking moment. It would be the moment that would say to people, it's gone too far, we, we have to figure this out. But, but watching where we are three months later, it feels like people have almost forgotten about the insurrection and that they still haven't figured out um, how to come to any kind of compromise. You know, Joe Biden is passing things basically with one party, uh, Republicans have yet to sort of come forward with anything they're really willing to compromise on. 
And so um, I am a very, I'm optimistic about politics and I'm optimistic about people, but I am not optimistic about this moment in politics. Um, it's just, it is, we are, we are not, we have not yet seemed to have bottomed out sufficiently to have figured out how we have to like figure out how to move forward. Which is not the most optimistic answer I could give you, but it is the way I, is truly what I think. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, the remarks from Ambassador Eisen. Um, so Ambassador Eisen, you have approximately five minutes. Thank you for joining us. I haven't seen the his picture yet, but I'm sure he's here, so. And indeed I am. Great. Indeed I am. Thank you, Provost Estri. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, 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 begin uh, by extending my heartfelt thanks to the Gupta Values Scholars Program and to Shashi and Margaret Gupta uh, for the program uh, and the Gupta's invitation to speak today, to Dean Sullivan, to Provost Estri for their introductions and to Michigan and Michigan State and Northern Virginia Community College. Uh, and of course, to all of you, uh, the scholars, you are selected based on your commitment to three powerful core values that the program and Shashi and Margaret stand for, integrity, respect for human dignity and excellence. Uh, in, in my family's a small business, a hamburger stand that my immigrant parents ran in South Los Angeles, we also had three values. Number one, uh, always do the right thing. Number two, always be loyal. And number three, always serve the best hamburger you can. And I think that those three values exactly parallel uh, those of the uh, GVS program. So, so I really feel at home uh, among all of you. And, and I was so pleased to be invited to speak to you on one of the most critical topics in my view that we face as a nation and as a world today. And that is um, personal and national integrity in a time of crisis. Uh, and to do so side by side uh, with my friends, uh, Jerry and Sarah who have fought for these values uh, in the crisis over the past four years, a crisis that continues. And the two of them are continuing to fight for ethics. That is not just flattery. It is a substantive point because the theme of what I want to share with you today, and I'll glance down at, at my clock. I'm not as clever as Sarah in setting an alarm, but I'll try to stay timely. Uh, the theme I want to discuss to you today is that issues of national integrity are really just issues of personal ethics magnified many, many times over. There's a wonderful saying in the Jewish Talmud that captures this um, uh, 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 a connection between the personal and the individual and the universal that I believe is very much at the core of American life, of the American uh, idea uh, of, of all of us uh, collectively attempting to work together. And that saying is that a person who saves a single life is as if he or she had saved an entire universe. Uh, the point is that there is a profound connection between the individual and the universal. And I think that that profound connection um, is the story, tells the story of the great crisis that Jerry reflected on with his views on the ethics structure and the way it, of our American rule of law and the way it succeeded and failed, and Sarah's story of how she broke uh, with uh, many of her longtime allies and the, and, and the Republican Party to, to fight for ethics uh, and integrity. Um, um, 
uh, uh, you know, we, we, we saw so many um, people uh, do the same uh, thing uh, in this era of Trump. And I don't say that in a partisan way at all. And in fact, I, I, it was so uh, uh, remarkable to me in, um, in, in, in listening to Sarah speak to remember that although I did not support the ex-president in his 2016 election, that I was slower than she was to see the threat that he represented because I actually volunteered to help on the transition so they would have an ethics program. And then I broke with the president-elect when he announced that he was gonna violate the constitution by taking foreign government cash emoluments. Of course, I also reminisced in, in hearing the congressman talk about the past years because I had the privilege to come uh, and um, to come and speak with him and his colleagues, particularly in those first dark years where we wondered what, what, whether our country would be up to the task. And it was, I believe that it was. Um, uh, and that is because um, um, it, the, as my book <clears throat> that Provost Estri was kind enough to reference, A Case for the American People, the whole point of that book is that in even though in many of the, I counted the other day, I was involved in opening over 500 legal matters against ex-President Trump and those around him and his administration. Perhaps the most prominent was the first impeachment. It did not succeed. Uh, uh, but where, where we uh, failed, the American people redeemed us um, and they understood that even with our successes and failures over those four years, we were making a case for the American people. That is what the Congressman, that is what Sarah did in the work that they described over the past four years. And I was privileged to help with that. Um, the uh, uh, ultimately, um, uh, 80 million Americans. I believe our election was a referendum on integrity, not a partisan election, but an ethics election. And uh, 80 million Americans voted for integrity. Of course, there were quite a number who voted the other way. Their loyalty to a lack of ethics has been dwindling, but we, we still have uh, somewhere uh, between 30 and 40 million Americans who, for example, subscribe to conspiracy theories, the big lie about the voting program, uh, about the vote uh, uh, of 2020. And, and that big lie is animating a voter suppression campaign around the country. And I just, before we go to questions, I wanted to leave you with a thought because we're looking to everyone in the Gupta Value Scholars Program, whatever your politics may be, this is not partisan. It's about ethics and integrity uh, in a time of crisis and the need for all of us individually to, to band together uh, to fight for ethics. I, I hope you will do that in the spirit that was exemplified by one of my wonderful mentors, uh, Jerry's uh, longtime colleague, the late Congressman uh, and American hero, John Lewis. He said something to me that I wanna leave you with in the midst of the first impeachment. He, he, I talked to him all throughout those years and Jerry can vouch for this. We were at a bunch of meetings together trying to figure out in Congress before the impeachment, how to fight for integrity. And I bumped into Congressman Lewis on the day that he announced he was gonna support the impeachment. Uh, Congressman Connolly was an early adopter. Congressman Lewis announced in the fall of 2019 that he would support the impeachment. I ran into him in one of the tunnels below Congress and he gripped me with that ferocious grip on my arm. And he said, Norm, impeach Trump, but do it with love. And, and that is the message that I wanna leave for all of you. We, we need to have this fight for ethics and integrity, but we need to do it with love, love for the values, the three core values of the GVS program, love for our country, love for our constitution and love for each other. We must hate the sin 
but love the sinner, even the people who we're trying to, to bring back to the American idea. I fear that I, I have not been as efficient on my time as I had hoped, but I slashed my remarks in half. I wrote much too much because <laughs> I'm so passionate about these issues. So thank you so much for having me today, and I'll be tight in my answers to your questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ice, and I can tell from reading your book that you're passionate about your work. Uh, the first question for uh, Ambassador Eisen is from Aya Waller Bay. I, Ida is, or Aya is a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan in sociology. So Aya, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Eisen, for your remarks. I have a question about voting, actually. So I spent some time on the Voter Protection Program website and noticed you listed, yes. you listed three ways the organization is protecting the right to vote. Um, first is legal, the second is law enforcement, and the third is communications. So can you talk more about the strategic role law enforcement plays in protecting voters, especially in consideration of those who may feel like the presence and visibility of law enforcement at the polls and otherwise may make them feel unsafe and intimidated. And I think of the incident with Representative Park Cannon at Atlanta, Democrat who was actually arrested on March 25th and charged for the obstruction of law enforcement and disruption of the General Assembly for knocking on Governor Brian Kim's office as he was signing the state's controversial voting bill into law. So how do we ensure that all voters feel protected by law enforcement when practicing their right to vote? Thank you so much. When, when she was arrested, I thought for a moment that we had lost the American Revolution and we were back in a monarchy where you're uh, not allowed to knock on the king's door if he doesn't want you. But fortunately, they're not charging her. They've announced that she's not going to be prosecuted. I, I think that law enforcement, given the very challenging history that you describe, I uh, that the critical role and the thing we try to do at the Voter Protection Program, which is my outside and outside nonprofit organization that I chair, but bipartisan with, I chair it with uh, Governor, former Governor Christy Todd Whitman, um, the Republican governor and Bush cabinet member. Um, what we try to do is solve the problem of how law enforcement can protect all voters, for example, from militias who want to intimidate or armed individuals who want to show up and intimidate at the polls without having the unintended consequence that suddenly if a lot of armed police are swarming the polls, you're gonna scare away all the voters. And it turns out the secret is that you want to have deep, deep conversations in advance with those who represent the communities, particularly people of color and communities that um, are at risk, at disproportionate risk, to try to have conversations in advance about how to de-escalate and how to partner. And I was privy to some of those conversations. All of you can see we're very transparent at the Voter Protection Program. We have wonderful law enforcement leaders who share this philosophy of service around the country. Um, and, um, and we worked a lot to bring together those folks to talk in advance. How do we deal with this if it happens so that we don't end up intimidating the voters? And there is so much work to be done between law enforcement and the communities that they serve, not only in my lane of voting, but in every different aspect. So I'm proud in my own small way, this was an emergency project to deal with the president's uh, attacks, what we correctly predicted would be the attacks on a peaceful transition. And I'm proud that we were able, we had a very peaceful election day, and that include dealing with some armed individuals who did show up to intimidate we did it in the right way and it worked well and we have to learn those lessons. Thank you for that good question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, second question comes from a Nova student, a sophomore, Layla Rashid, and uh, she's majoring in nursing and uh, Bob is going to read her question for us. Yeah. So Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, Layla had a member of her uh, immediate family pass away, and that's why she cannot be here tonight. Oh. So uh, here's the question. Ambassador Eisen, 
With the image of the United States having been tarnished over the past few years, how important is it for our foreign service personnel to act in an ethical manner at all times? Well, that's such a good question. And please give my condolences to Layla, Bob, and tell her that it, 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 it's a, one of the most critical questions in American foreign policy today. You know, I was so shocked and disgusted when I saw Mike Pence on a taxpayer funded trip giving a speech with Jerusalem as a backdrop. Um, and again, I'm not saying it in a partisan way, not Pence, I'm sorry, uh, our uh, Secretary of State Pompeo giving that speech as a, uh, it's so unprecedented to have a Secretary of State go abroad to a hotly contested area and exploit that on a taxpayer funded trip, even if that little slice of it is reimbursed for political advantage. So we have a big restoration job to do in foreign policy, but I think we're off to a very good start. I could say a lot about it. I've written about it. The single most important thing we've done is to admit to the world our own frailties and foibles. If you look at the administration's um, blueprint that they've released for their foreign policy, the initial blueprint. They talk in there about, we need to fix democracy at home so we can be good democratic partners all over the world. And I think that I found as a diplomat that that spirit of humility serves you well in attempting to work with others to promote ethics and democracy. Thank you. It's now time to uh, open up the conversation to questions from any of the Gupta Value Scholars. Just as a quick reminder, you can either raise your hand uh, in a virtual way, uh, and if you already haven't, you can also submit questions um, via the chat feature. Uh, please let us know who you're directing your question to, and I would uh, tell the panel members if you also have comments relative to the question, even though it may not be directed it, uh, to you, please feel free to uh, add your thoughts. So Chris, I'm gonna actually turn it to you to uh, let us know who's gonna be first. Thanks, Doug. Um, there is a, a question in the chat um, and I'm so sorry, I can't seem to see who it's from, but I'm gonna go ahead and read it. It's directed to Ms. Longwell. If the Republican Party and the Democratic Party have switched views throughout the decades, what values keep you connected to the Republican Party now versus the Democratic Party or even choosing to become independent? It's a great question and a totally fair one. And I'll tell you this, if I, if I was joining a political party today, I would have a lot more in common with um, a bunch of the centrist Democrats who got elected in 2018, the Abigail Spanberger, Alyssa Slotkin, um, Connor Lamb kind of faction. Um, and, and, and the Republican Party has shifted away from so many of the things that attracted me to it. I will say one of the reasons that I, uh, you know, I feel like a political independent, but there is a part of me, I guess, just a stubborn part that feels like you cannot just give this party over to what has increasingly become a crazy wing, right? Somebody has to stay there and say, uh, and, and right now, look, there's such a small number. You got Adam Kinzinger and, and Liz Cheney, you know, there's 10, um, 10 members of, of the, the Congress, um, of the House who voted to impeach, seven in the Senate. Uh, I want to support those people. I want to help, uh, you know, I want to help those people um, not get beaten. You know, Donald Trump is going to try to primary every single one of the Republicans who voted to impeach him and spend money to defeat those people. And so somebody needs to stay in the party to protect those people. However, I would say, you know, my feeling is, is that it's not just Donald Trump. Donald Trump was a cancer on the Republican party and he's metastasized and the Republican party is in a very dangerous place. And so my goal is actually to work with Democrats despite a, a fair number of policy differences, but, but believing that we have the same overarching sort of fidelity to liberal democracy. And I, I'm going to make up probably the furthest right flank of what I hope is a large pro-democracy coalition that holds uh, the current dangerous version of the Republican Party at bay. That's 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 why. 
Could I, could I add something? Chris, um, I, I want to say this about Sarah and to Sarah. I hope you do stay a Republican. And I want to say to the scholars on this program, what you've heard from Sarah is moral clarity. You heard no rationalization. What I hear all the time from my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle, for people who know better, who privately share much of Sarah's critique, they lack the intestinal fortitude and they use rationalization to get away with it. So they'll say, yeah, I know, no, no, you're right, of course, but you know, he's not wrong about X, Y, and Z, or he made a point on A, B, and C. And, and when you hear that, but the rationalization follows. And that rationalization is what has allowed scores of people to uh, hide and justify their fear uh, and cloud any kind of moral clarity, which we so desperately needed and need. So I salute you, Sarah. I, 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 I hope all the scholars today have heard the moral clarity I've heard. Thank you, both of you. I'd like to turn to uh, Elliot. Uh, he has a question, I think, for uh, Representative Conley. Elliot? Uh, yes, uh, Jerry, you began your remarks by talking about the importance of integrity in Congress, uh, but I'm not sure integrity is the norm in Congress or government more broadly. Uh, as you recall, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were insider trading uh, fiascos with uh, Senator Feinstein and Loeffler. Um, there have been speaking gigs for past presidents as long as as long as I can remember, hundreds of thousands of dollars transferred in essentially what I see as delayed bribes uh, to presidents to protect political interests um, and, and just general propping up of a wealthy aristocracy that I think fails to produce politicians that represent the everyday American. Uh, my question would be, how would you combat that or how would you suggest we combat that? You know, good question, Elliot. And I think it kind of goes back to the question Helen asked Sarah a little earlier, which really goes to human behavior, right? Um, why do you go into public service? It is not for self-enrichment. It is public service. And you're not entitled to anything. And if it gets into your head that, look how hard I work. Look how little I make. Look what few benefits I get. So I'm entitled now and then to stay at your vacation, you know, mansion, uh, you know, in the Caribbean, Elliot, or I'm entitled to a little weekend off in someone's private yacht, or I'm entitled to that gold Rolex watch a friend of mine wants to give me who has maybe a pending interest before the government. Once that gets into your mindset, uh, you're already corrupt. And so how do we preserve integrity, personal integrity? How do we make sure people go into government, whether it's elective life or, or, or government service, for all the right reasons and stays there? Um, you're asking a profound question about human behavior. I will tell you, I spent 26 years in elective public life. The overwhelming majority of people I've worked with, Republican and Democrat, uh, go into it for honorable reasons and for the right reasons. Uh, and, uh, you know, we sometimes, because of headlines, allow ourselves to maybe uh, taint the whole, uh, the whole enterprise as corrupt and venal and uh, unworthy of our consideration and our democracy. And that's not true. Uh, put aside philosophical differences, most uh, most political figures I know uh, from a behavioral point of view try to stay within lanes uh, that uh, are ethical and that are careful. Um, but there are all too many people who go into public life and private life, private sector, uh, who are venal, who are you know out to maximize benefits for themselves and their families and their friends, and they take the whole process. So that's why I think, you know, if we were all angels, no one would need a code of ethics. Precisely because we're not, we need a code of ethics. We need 
uh, guardrails, uh, ethical guardrails that uh, circumscribe behavior and, 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 and enforce it. Um, and that's where accountability, I think, can be a really useful thing because in case you're tempted, knowing that there is um, potential enforcement and punishment, if you, uh, buy, you know, go outside those guardrails, is a necessary part of, uh, I think, public life. Um, and that's why I mentioned, for example, if you, you know, there are areas in our, we saw the, we saw the flaws in holding the president accountable. There are some solutions beyond impeachment. I mentioned one, get rid of that office of legal counsel opinion um, so that he knows I could be indicted as opposed to Trump knowing with impunity, I can't be indicted. Um, and, uh, but I would, I would also commend the Supreme Court. I, I don't think the Supreme Court should be above accountability and they are right now. There's virtually no check on the Supreme Court um, and including, I might add, even public access. You know, you're lucky if 40 human beings who aren't party to the case in front of them ever get into the Supreme Court to watch a Supreme Court deliberation or a case being argued. Uh, and that's why I think, for example, part of accountability is democratizing the Supreme Court, uh, putting term limits on them, and also putting cameras in the court. Um, so, I mean, there are things we can do, but we're never going to perfect human nature, unfortunately. If I can just add a short coda uh, and I'll extract the three general principles like the three core values of GVS or the three rules of the hamburger stand. There are three general principles that my friend Jerry just articulated. You need strong rules. It needs to be reinforced by strong transparency like those cameras that he's talking about and, and all wrapped in strong tone at the top. And if you look at how we achieved the most scandal-free when I was President Obama's ethics czar and I designed the system with him, it wasn't fancy. It was those three rules, strong ethics rules. Uh, he writes about this in, in our work together in his autobiography, uh, strong transparency mm -hmm. and strong tone at the top, the example that he set. The past four years have been the exact opposite on all three, which is the reason for the crisis, part of the reason, the crisis that we're talking about. And I'll just echo having represented government officials and worked side by side and worked in and outside of government, including government officials who got in trouble. Uh, uh, the vast, vast majority of people in government are trying to do their best. We are in a bad place at the moment because not because of a lack of, not because of venal interests, but because of a lack of political courage. I think an asymmetrical lack of political courage. Um, that's cowardice, but it's not venality. At this point, um, I'd like to uh, respect our distinguished panelists' time that we told them that we would end at six o'clock. I'd like to thank them. This has been a very interesting conversation. And I hope I'll direct this comment to Shashi and Margaret that maybe when we get back to Washington, we can continue this, um, but in a face-to-face -face kind of way. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Shashi and Margaret uh, to uh, wrap things up and in doing that also thank them for their uh, amazing generosity and uh, their help with all of the things that we've been trying to do um, through their good graces. So Shashi and Margaret. Thank you, Doug. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation and I'd like to thank our panelists, Jerry, Norm, Sarah, uh, your comments today were so uh, insightful and really very helpful in framing uh, the importance of ethics, uh, especially in this moment of crisis today. I think one of my big takeaways from today that I think each one of you mentioned is that ethics and integrity really start with each one of us individually, our personal action and having a North Star that's bigger than ourselves or our party or our peer group, whatever that is, but that North Star is so important and each one of us make a big difference in how we act. 
So anyway, I really, really appreciate uh, you all of taking the time today and, and sharing your very insightful thoughts with our with the group. Chris and Doug, thank you guys so much for organizing this and, and, and putting so much effort into it. And Bob and, and Dean Mike Solomon, thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been it's been great. And I'll just give Shasha. I a just minute. want to say a few <laughs> words um, of thanks to the scholars. The questions were uh, hard hitting and thought provoking. And I know I will, uh, uh, you know, I will rethink things based on the arguments and the discussions we've had today. And I wouldn't be surprised if the panelists also on reflection on the questions and the, the dialogue, you know, uh, it has an effect, a positive effect on them as well. I know they will on me. So thank you guys. You were, you really impressive and, it was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. And hopefully, like I said, we will be able to join with each other again, potentially even in the fall of this coming academic year. Yes. Thank yes. you. Please. Sarah, Jerry, thank you, Norm, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for everybody. Thank Bye -bye. Great event. You. See you in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>